Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Anthony Harvey. I'm the editor of the Dictionary of Medieval Latin from Celtic Sources, or DMLCS. And my colleague, Joseph Flahev, is the other member of our team, and he's manning our stall out in the, the main library there. So during the rest of the day, you can talk to one or other of us there if you would like further elaboration on some of this material. So to give a bit of background, um, the DMLCS is conducted under the auspices of this academy and takes its place as one of a family of medieval Latin dictionary enterprises being conducted across Europe under a plan originally mooted by the International Union of Academies, or UAI. Each of these Latin enterprises has as its mission the detailed scientific analysis and interpretation of the Latin texts written within a particular geographical area. And in the case of our DMLCS, the relevant area consists of the territories that were Celtic speaking in the early Middle Ages. That is Ireland, the former Roman Britain, Brittany, Scotland, and the Isle of Man, as well as the monasteries that had been founded by Irish pilgrims as they traveled across most of the continent. The other projects in the Latin scheme are likewise mostly conducted under the auspices of national or quasi-national academies. And this photograph shows a volume from each of the participating projects, including ours, which is the, uh, the, the terracotta colored one there, um, as these were displayed in the Bavarian Academy of Sciences in Munich in 2012. And this map shows how in a mosaic-like way our projects between them cover nearly all the territory in which Latin was used in the Middle Ages, thus providing a key to understanding the thousand years of Western European history locked up in the documents that were penned in those times. Now, it's around now that one often encounters the question, why do we need all these different Latin dictionaries? Surely Latin, of all languages, has been sufficiently studied and codified over the centuries, and everyone is aware of large standard dictionaries of it that have been around for generations. Well, the answer is that the big Latin dictionaries that everyone knows about are at least mainly lexicons of the classical language, that of the Roman Empire. And not everyone realizes that when the formal structures of that empire fell apart in the early fifth century, its official language, Latin, continued with undiminished vitality as the everyday spoken tongue of the people across most of its territory. Far from going into a decline, Latin went on developing uh, naturally and in different ways in different places, eventually becoming the separate languages that we know as Spanish, French, Italian, and so on. But people didn't stop reading and writing during the millennium and a half that that transition took. And indeed, the written Latin output of the period completely dwarfs the amount of material that had been composed during imperial times. Yet, standard Latin dictionaries deal only with the earlier classical period, while standard dictionaries of Spanish, French, etc. deal only with the modern tongues. Only in recent decades has an attempt been made to reckon systematically with the huge amount of documentation from the medieval period that lies between, namely by means of the European scheme that I'm talking about. And its mosaic-like makeup reflects the geographical diversification of the language itself. As the map shows, there are about 16 projects involved. Years or even decades of work have already gone into most of them, and a few are now complete. Some, like those being compiled in Spain, track the seamless development of their local vernaculars from something very like classical Latin down to something approaching the modern Romance tongues of their various areas, Castilian, Catalan, whatever. Others, like our own DMLCS project here, deal with a Latin that may never have been the everyday tongue of the regions they cover, but which nevertheless was a key medium by which the local medieval civilization enshrined itself for written transmission to posterity. And in respect of the territory covered by DMLCF specifically, our non-classical lexicon of Celtic Latinity has so far been published for letters A to H, and drafts have been completed, or nearly so, for all the remaining letters except the small letter O and the huge letter S. We have said that we'll finish it by 2025, which will place us in about the middle of the pack in terms of progress made by the various ventures in the European scheme. 
In the meantime, every few years, the editorial teams of the scheme meet for a colloquium, and this usually proves useful because we have so much in common. Indeed, we have a lot in common with dictionary projects generally, even when their subject matter isn't Latin at all, but a different language entirely. And that's because of the similarities methodologically. In particular, it's helpful to be able to compare notes with one another when something new comes up in terms of technique, so as to avoid inefficiently reinventing the wheel. And if you're wondering in what context such new things can come up after all these years, the answer these days is digitization. All of the medieval Latin projects, as well as others, are now engaged in various forms of digitization, though we actually were the first to do so, so that's something we're rather proud of. The point is that issuing a dictionary, any dictionary, in digital form potentially makes it enormously much more informative to the user than is the very same dictionary containing the same information when presented on paper. And in our own project, we're doing both, by the way. I don't think book versions will ever go out of use, but digitization can supplement them wonderfully. And here's how. Let us take a more or less randomly selected set of consecutive entries from the DMLCS dictionary. As with all dictionaries, the reason these particular entries are consecutive is, of course, the fact that they are alphabetically arranged. But if that is the reason for their sequencing, it follows that their definitions will come from all over the semantic range. As one can see, even just this set of a few consecutive Latin words beginning with the letter A, manages to embody meanings as diverse as a joining together, combining or integrating, or to hook or catch, and words for the tide, for intercession, and for supportive. Now, let's say we're interested in a particular one of these, namely tide. If we want to find out what other Latin words mean a tide, a hard copy version of the dictionary won't help us the words will be scattered around the alphabet, and we'd have to leaf through the whole dictionary to find them. But with the digital version, we can search on the definitions just as readily as on the Latin headwords. And searching on the English word tide in our dictionary duly produces this result. As one can see, the Latin headwords now begin with various letters of the alphabet because the organizing principle of the set has switched to the uh, definition and not the alphabetical sequence. And we've actually published this particular result on tides as a separate interpretative article, the information having originally been requested of us by a retired sea captain, not a Latinist at all. And this shows how digitally searching on definitions can be useful for people interested in a particular topic, concept, or entity. Now, something else that one can see varying between the entries that are united by referring to tides is, of course, the different sources from which the examples are drawn. In our usage, three-letter abbreviations refer to classes of texts where these are anonymous. So, SCH means scholastic and THL means theological. And four-letter ones name identifiable authors. So we can see that writers in our corpus who refer to tides include the geographer Digwill, that's D-I-C-L, the Breton monk Billy, and others, including, perhaps most interestingly, the seventh century, the mysterious seventh century Irishman Virgilius Maro Grammaticus. As one can see, he coined the Latin word deundare to refer to the ebb of the tide. But what other words did he generate? Again, it would take us ages trawling through the paper dictionary to find out. But with a digital version, we can search on Virgilius's reference code, which as you see is VGLG, and here is part of the result. As can be seen, the headwords are spread widely through the alphabet, and the definitions range equally widely in semantic terms. This author made up a great many words, so this is just a selection. From, even from this one screenful, he can be seen to have coined an adjective meaning concise and an adverb for long ago, together with new nouns for things as disparate as famous people, an exposition, a meal, 
and the making of riddles or puzzles, as well as generating a verb meaning to arm with a spear. And Virgilius's tied word is merely one of these. By searching on the VGLG code in this way and, and using all the data from the result, our project has in fact been able to publish a fairly thorough scholarly spin-off article on precisely the word coinings of Virgilius Mara Grammaticus, as well as various separate analyses of the usages of other named authors by means of searching on the specific codes that we had allocated to them. And this shows how digitally searching on authors can be useful for people interested in literary history. Let's go back to another set of consecutive words from the DMLCS dictionary. As before, these are consecutive because of being arranged according to how they're spelt, and they mean all sorts of different things. But this time, let's concentrate on something else that varies about them, namely the geographical areas from which the examples in the texts are derived. This information is embodied in the codes we use to key the references. And you can see here, A, that refers to the former Roman Britain, C, to works by Irish monks on the continent, E, to Scotland, and D, to Brittany. And here we see a new word for a sister being used by a Breton monk. But how many other coinings in Celtic Latinity were generated by specifically Bretons? Again, having a digital version of the dictionary means we can search on geographical codes. And so here is part of what we get if we use the D code to look for Brittany specifically. Again, the Latin headwords, though of course still in alphabetical order, are no longer sequential. And again, the meanings are of all different kinds. By using a similar search to identify words coined in Wales and to compare them with Latin words invented by the Irish, I have in fact been able to publish an assessment of the nature of the language in the two countries in the early Middle Ages. It was striking how different it appears to have been, and this prompted a surprising but I hope convincingly documented conclusion about the longevity of Latin in Celtic Britain after the Roman withdrawal. It may have lasted up to Norman times, a point of great interest to national and social historians of Wales. And this shows how digitally searching on geographical provenance can be useful for people interested in comparative philology. But back to Brittany. You'll see that one of the Latin words coined there means white-fronted geese. The context shows that the term is being used precisely here in what we can classify as a specifically zoological sense. Well, you can guess where we're going next. A lot of revealing light can be cast upon the particular interests or concerns of any society by looking to see what technical terms it has felt necessary to coin. Embedded in the entries of our dictionary are 14 distinct labels to flag such specialist vocabulary. The zoological label that you see here is just one of them, the others including botanical, musical, medical, philosophical, and so on. And the results of this are potentially of great value to scholars of any of the disciplines concerned. And this shows how digitally searching on technical labels can be useful for people interested in particular areas of specialization. The very theme that informed the Munich Colloquium of Editors at which that display of dictionaries was, was put forward. As an example, taking the zoological label specifically and searching for that across all areas of our dictionary gives this result. Again, the entries come from across the alphabet as far as we have compiled it. And as far as the meanings are concerned, they range across the whole bird and animal kingdom, from slow worms to sparrowhawks and from periwinkles to stoats. The search even reveals a contrastive cross-reference between different kinds of geese. So natural historians, please take note. Now, as I said before, the searching opportunities I've shown are in principle applicable to any systematic dictionary of any language, because hardworking lexicographers will already have packed all the information into the entries in much the same way that we have. The value that systematic digitization has added to our own dictionary and can do to others is the ability to retrieve it all again for any number of purposes in a systematic, comprehensive, and coherent way. 
So thank you very much. And just to say, a published uh, version of, of what you have just heard, and uh, at greater length as well, is, is available free from our store out there. It's the dark blue booklet. Thank you. Thank you.